Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It's not going to be up here, but let's, uh, if you would, stand for the reading of the word. And uh, it, it's not going to be on the slide. But the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. May God add his blessings to his word. You may be seated. We are beginning this, this very awesome study as we go into this book of Revelation. It is a powerful book. It is a book that I believe that are many different interpretations. There are many different aspects of people, and they love to talk about this book. Um, and it, I want to I wanna approach Revelation from probably a perspective that you may have never heard before, um, because I believe that as I've studied Revelation, there is a unveiling that has happened in my life as I've gone deeper and deeper within the book. What I can tell you from a matter of fact is that Revelation is a very Jewish book. It is a very Jewish book. It has literally more than 2,000 allusions to Hebrew Scriptures. 2,000. Over 400 references uh, indirectly to the Torah or the prophets and literally 90 quotes directly from the Torah or the Pentateuch and the prophets. So we, we see a book that is placed firmly within the culture of, of Jewish people. And I think many of our modern interpretations have missed this critical aspect. And I believe that they are, because they missed this important aspect, they're not able to fully grasp the complete ramification of what God is doing in this book. And so... But as before we go any further, as part of introduction, I want to cover the four major views. There are others, but I want to cover four major views of history, that, uh, the, of interpretation, rather, that you will see. The first one is the historist. Historicist. Sorry. The book of Revelation is prophecy about church history from the time of John to the end of the world. So that's one interpretation of revelation think about where you think you might stand right now before we go any further think about where you are there is the preterist and there is the book of revelation is prophecy that was fulfilled primarily in the first century a.d so within the first 100 years the book of revelation was fulfilled then there's the futurist the book of revelation is prophecy primarily about the future and the end of the world primarily about the future and the end of the world. Then there's the idealist. The book of Revelation is a non-historical, non-prophetic drama about spiritual reality. So most people that I have encountered are one of these four categories. Most people, now for me, the church of God is typically a mixture of the historist and the futurist. Mostly we hold uh, an amalgamation or a combination of the two views. I haven't met anybody in the Church of God that's preterist. Um, and but those are usually different, uh, different view of the end times and a different view of the millennium altogether. There are some people that I would imagine if they would admit it, they're idealists, uh, that they don't they give up trying to interpret the book, so they just attribute it to all, that it can't be historical, it can't be prophetic, they just talk about it. But I've never met anybody that, that has had that major view. But these are the four that you will find in most of, of, of interpretation. But we, we are going to cover it from a Hebraic perspective that will, that will cover the first category and the third category of being history and being future. Revelation 1.1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. Things which must take shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. 
Now, the word revelation here is the word apocalypse. That's where you commonly hear the word, the, the other name for this book is the apocalypse. Now, apocalypse is just simply a word that means to unveil. To unveil. So what revelation really is about is what you read in the very first sentence here. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The unveiling of Jesus Christ. You see, what we find is that most people in Judaism had, re had by this time and the time period of when we think this was written was around 90 A.D. was around 90 A.D. And by this time, we believe that most people had, had, uh, had began to move away from the... It, the church began to form into more Gentile realms. And the church began to go forth and, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that weren't necessarily Jewish. And God began to do a mighty work. And so Revelation is, is, all, is not only a conversation to those that are living in the land of Rome, but it's also a conversation to those Jews that do not understand how Jesus is the Messiah. You have, you have Jesus Christ. You have Yeshua, which is, would be Hebrew for Jesus, the one that saves you from your sins. And you have Christ which is the word for Messiah in Hebrew, and it means the anointed one. So you have in the very first phrase of this book that this entire book is not necessarily about the future, but it does cover it. It's not necessarily about Rome, but they're in there. It does, it's, that's not what it's the point of the book. The point of the book is revealing or unveiling the Messiah, Jesus Christ. To the world and so because of this we we have seen people trying for many years to to try to develop a, a interpretation of this passage and of this book that has that has been very very hard to grasp it's very hard to understand and 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 because this Jesus you can't put him in a box you can't just say boys oh, this this and this because the Jewish early believers put Jesus in the box and said it's only for Jews and then what happened is that at Cornelius house they got baptized in the Holy Spirit and they realized well it's or maybe it's for maybe it's for uh, those those people that are good Jews that are proselytes but they're not Jew, Jewish by birth or they're, they're righteous people but they're not they're not uh, they're not necessarily Jews and so they they called it over that but by the time we hit Acts 19 and God's baptizing in the Holy Ghost, the, uh, the church at Ephesus, by the time we hit there, these people are completely and totally Gentile. And they are not connected to Jewish religion. They're not connected to Jerusalem in any way. And so this box that we have put Jesus in is not going to work anymore. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book that we believe that was written and the canon or the scriptures it's the last book that we hold to it's the last book that we believe is written by John the Apostle the early church fathers testify that John the Apostle wrote it in his old age and uh, he as he was uh, writing this book God we will see what happens here in a little while and then after after uh, after he wrote the book we realize that he was moved on into Ephesus and he became that's where he wrote first second and third John and he became the pastor of the church at Ephesus but during this time we see the we see the understanding that either revelation was the last book written or first second and third John was the last book written but it's right there towards the end it's right there at the very end and so Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants. That would be us. God gave us this book to show us Jesus. And I can tell you, when we reach the end of the book, it should bring you hope. By the time we reach the final chapter of Revelation, by the time you get to the last verse of the book, when we reach the end, if you understand what we have just read, if you, have, if you will hold to what we have just held to and, and study it and really grasp what this is, when you reach the end of the book, you're going to know Jesus in a better and greater way because this book is all about Him. This book is all about Him 
in one, one way or another. And you're going to see that as we go forward. Now, John, as I said earlier, John is, a, is writing from a Hebraic perspective. And so if you really want to get into a very deep study of this book, you should try starting in Daniel, then move over into Revelation, because John writes in a very similar fashion to Daniel. In fact, he uses phrasing like Daniel, like he'll say, I, John. And Daniel, which we know was written first, he'll say, I, Daniel. And, and it just that's just one example of many different ways that they are connected. And so this, this book is Hebraic. It is unbelievably Hebraic if we know what to look for. And these, these things which must shortly take place. These are the things that are going to happen from, the, from that moment that John wrote it to this moment right here. He sent it and signified it. Now this means basically signed it or sealed it and, and by his angel to his servant John. Or by his messenger to his servant John. Then verse 2 says, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So John, as we see here in the beginning, bore witness of the word of God. He saw this. Now, the word witness here is the word for martyr. And um, it means that, that he is testifying on the behalf of Jesus Christ. This is the same word that's used in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when you, Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses unto me. Be witnesses unto me. So this, this word that's used in Revelation 1, 2, is used in Acts 1, 8, the idea of martyr, being a martyr. This means that you, not only, not that necessarily that he's losing his physical life, but that he's being absorbed by the message that he has to give. That it consumes him and he's got to do it. In fact, he gives the word because he can do anything else but give the word. You'll hear sometimes old-fashioned preachers will say, it's like a fire, shut up in my bones. You know what I'm saying? That's what it's about, that you just got to let it forth. You just got to go forth and, and preach. And this is what John is saying. He's got to bring it out. He's the witness. He's the, the message of the word of God, the, the impacting of the word of God to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw so he saw all these things he understood all these things uh, and he testifies of them now I want to read verse 3 if you can believe it we're only going to cover the first 10 verses tonight so we're not going to get very far I mean, this is going to be an introduction but verse 3 says blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. The first, there are three things that you've got to see here in this particular word. And that is, blessed is he who reads it. So I want you to see that, first of all, this book was written to be read to the congregation and those who hear. So you'll see in the very beginning of this phrasing, it's a singular. There is one person reading it and there are people hearing it. So this book, Revelation, is intended to be used in worship. We don't use it in worship very much anymore because people are scared of it. But like I said, if we would read it from cover to cover, from the verse 1 of 1-1 one, one to the last verse of 20, chapter 22, you would be excited to see how God, what He's going to do. And by the end of it, we would be rejoicing and shouting for joy and when we see and hear about the pure water of life when you see the clearest crystal coming from the throne of God you see all the problems and all the struggle that the church world is going to be facing and yet at the end Jesus conquers and at the end of it Jesus is going to conquer and we see all this happening and you find the passages where he's going to wipe all the tears from your eyes and there's not going to be any more death or pain and all those former things are going to be passed away that's at the end of the book there's worship friend it's exciting to get into and understand the beauty of what this is here and so he says he pronounced a blessing over those that hear it those that read it, those that hear it, and what else? Those that keep it. Hear it, 
rather read it, hear it, and keep it. It's critical that we see this. He who reads it is going to be blessed. Those who hear the words of this prophecy are going to be blessed. And those who keep it or guard it in Hebrew. Those that guard it. Those that watch over it. You see, I, the Bible is clear that Christ is returning for a church that is looking for His appearing. And so when you look at these words and you see Revelation, He's looking for a church that is looking for Him. And so you've got to guard what is written in here because for the time is near. Revelation is meant for it to be an active part of our church. But as I said though, in order to hear something, you've got to, there's an element here in Hebrew of comprehension. Now, have you ever been sitting in a class in school and you're hearing what the teacher's saying. But it isn't making any sense. You know what I mean? So what good is it other than wasting your time? You know, what good is it? So the teacher, some, a good teacher will turn around and see that. And he or she will start, well, let's do an example on the board. Johnny, get up here and, you know, Susie, come over here. And let's try And they'll get the students to active, being part of it when they're not getting. So... In or hearing, there's a part of understanding what is happening. And so one of the things that you really have to pray when you read Revelation is to pray for understanding as the book is being unveiled in front of your eyes. So when we are, the, this first night is an introduction, but when we go through this and as we process through each and every night, we... I pray that you would oh, pray and ask God for understanding of what is going to happen and what is going to take place in this book that it will bless you, that it will help you understand it. Because hearing with understanding is going to transform your attitude about your Christian walk. And then once your attitude and your heart is transformed by the words that you have heard, then it will be your job to keep or guard that understanding. Because then the enemy will try to come in and try to steal that or try to say things against that and try to hit you in ways that, that will try to pull these understandings away from your mind. You see, the, the, once again, as I said, this is a Hebraic idea. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear the, see the first verse there in verse 4. Hear, O Israel. Understand, O Israel. And then you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You see this, this, this powerful passage of Scripture that Jewish people hold to on a regular basis, that it's their Shema. It's something that they quote. It's something that they learn as a child. And then the Bible says in verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Then verse 7, And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. He's saying here in, in this passage in Deuteronomy 6, Four through nine. He's saying that this, when you understand the word of God, when you understand a blessed un, uh, prophetic word, you need to teach your children and you need to raise your family with the word of God. You need to teach your children the principles of the Bible. Can I tell you in our land today, the worst problem that we have has nothing to do with Washington, D.C. It has everything to do with our families not teaching their children the word of God and or not living it in front of them. And so we, if, we would, if we would return back to a biblical understanding of what it means to walk with God, what it means to live daily and walk with God, the blessing of the Lord would return back to us. So there is a, there is a conditional blessing. Sometimes there are, there are unconditional blessings that you'll find in Scripture that... The, uh, that you'll see that God says that He has decreed it, it is there. 
But there is also conditional blessings, and this is one of those. If you won't read it, and you won't listen to it or hear it, and you won't keep it, you won't be blessed. And so it's a conditional response based on your response. What are you going to do with what you hear? What are you going to do with what's, what's going to take place? What are you going to do after we get through to the end of this? Because God has promised you a blessing for studying this book. And I, want to, I want to get it at the end of it. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to go through this whole thing and say and just give up at the end. I want the blessing that God has for me because we studied this thing together. And so we, we have to measure our, our understanding with, with what God is saying to us. So for the next few minutes, we're going to uh, cover the next six verses. Does anybody have any questions? I surprised you with that one, didn't I? <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try to build in question time at the end so that my teachers don't revolt on me. What I mean by that is if we start asking, you start asking me questions, this is going to be at 9 o'clock, and I won't have teachers by the end of the night. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to, I'm going to try to build in time for that. So if you don't have any questions, we'll move on. Verse number 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and his to come from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So right out of the gate, verse 4, we have no idea what that means. <laughs> we look at this and we say, what is going on at the very beginning? You see, as I said, once you begin to hear with understanding, their blessing will then come. The word seven is a number, of course, and it is a powerful word in Hebrew um, because it represents perfection and completion. So there were way more than seven churches in Asia during this time. But this letter that was written, John, writing this letter to them, he's saying that he's saying this letter is for the complete church. And he identifies them that are in Asia. But we're going to talk about the seven churches in a couple of weeks. But these, but John, in the number seven, you're going to see this number all the way through the book of Revelation. The number seven is, is a powerful number for Jewish people. You see there are seven days. You see the Sabbath day. You see the years of the years of jubilee based upon the sabbath of the land you have seven jewish festivals you've got many other sevens i mean i i went through and i started i thought man if i started going down through all the sevens would be here two two or three hours and explaining every single one of them um sprinkling on the sacrifice seven times i mean many different types of seven so we well there's one in particular and uh, it's, the next, uh, it's the next slide that I want you to get. And if it's, you can see it, it's seven, and it's the menorah. Now, this is an actual golden menorah under lock and key on display in Israel. This is the golden candlestick in English or the menorah in Hebrew that they will use for the third temple. They build it. And so the temple, the end times temple, this is the menorah they have ready. They're just waiting to build the temple. And so this, they have it displayed so you can watch it and look at it, but they, they have it ready. As you will see, as, as you go into the temple, as you go into the inner court uh, or the, the holy place, not the most holy place, but the holy place, you'll see the, the candlestick or the menorah standing there with its lamp lit and each one of those have have a uh, will have some type of oil on the top of it that they will have lit for that time and so the for instance what uh, they this, the menorah is something that is very powerful of course in, in jewish religion and you see it everywhere when you speak about judaism and but the number seven is so powerful in revelation 
that literally there is a menorah type outline for the whole book and there is this, it goes in three major distinct patterns there is we will see the first three arms of the candlestick we will see the midpoint of the book and then we'll see the last three and I'm, I'm just kind of giving you that ahead of time to share with you where we're headed and so there this this idea is that there the powerful word of god is going to be a light to you as you understand it it's seven churches which are in asia now church of course is the word ecclesia these people are called out one so he's saying to them that are called out to them ek is out called ecclesia so ecclesia to those that are called out to those have been spoken over those that have called out of this world called out of darkness and brought into the marvelous light that called out of suffering and called out of the things of this world and brought into his redemptive plan those people that have been called out this book's for you now there are people that are making weird movies today and calling it revelation and calling it all kinds of different things whether they're christian or not and they're calling it uh, sometimes they call it christian but listen the word of god that's spoken here in revelation chapter one is for the church for those that are called out now you see grace to you and peace from him now grace is a new testament idea and as i've told you before grace is and there's many different uh, translations or excuse me interpretations of grace and definitions of grace but grace the idea of grace is some some people call it god's unmerited favor i call it god's empowering presence enabling you to live a righteous and holy life that's what grace is to me god's powering presence that comes into your life that enables you to live a righteous and holy life